Hi there. Uh, so uh, my name is Philip, and uh, I work on the technology behind a computer game called RuneScape. Uh, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about the history of how technology has changed uh, computer games over time, and maybe a little bit about what I think is going to happen in the near future to help make shape the computer games of the future. So when I was little, uh, my parents bought me a computer that uh, you may have already seen in one of the slides earlier, which is called a ZX Spectrum. Now, this was a pretty horrible little keyboard with rubber keys, uh, which you plugged into your TV, like a games console, uh, and into a cassette tape player. I, I won't go into what one of those is. Um, uh, and you, you would then sit there for about five minutes whilst it loaded a game for you. Uh, and it would load it off the tape and make a lot of horrible noises and uh, flashing lights whilst it did so, uh, a little something like this. I think, I think that's enough of that. That's uh, pretty horrible stuff. But uh, in any case, once it had loaded, uh, you got something really amazing. You got games that were great fun to play, and they, they were a lot like the sort of games that you get today on your mobile phone, except maybe uh, they were a lot harder, perhaps. Uh, and, and that was really because uh, it was very hard to fit into the memory of the computer, a very long, complicated game. And similarly, to load it all off the tape was quite difficult. So they had to make it so that you wouldn't just finish the game in less time than it took to load it in the first place, uh, which, which is quite an interesting way of looking at things, uh, really. I, I, it also was a thing that introduced me to programming in the first place. Like the BBC Micro that was talked about earlier, uh, it was very easy to get into the programming. You could get uh, straight into a programming environment uh, by just turning it on and uh, pressing a few keys. And it has on, on the screen, as you can see, uh, all the keys have got all the little keywords that you need to know written on them. And you just needed to press one of the buttons, and it would write them out for you. So it was, it was very easy to get started. And a lot of the challenges that uh, we were associated with writing games for uh, the ZX Spectrum are, are similar challenges to what the ones we face today. Uh, back then, it might have been, can we fit the game into the computer's memory? Uh, and, and 15 years ago, when we were writing RuneScape, it was, how can we get all the data across the internet to our players? Now, back then, uh, everyone was using dial-up internet, which was pretty horrible. I mean, no matter how bad you think your broadband might be today, it was worse. Uh, and Today, you wouldn't even think about downloading a game over the internet. I mean, I'm sure you probably a lot of you have got Steam, and you would download uh, a massive game overnight, perhaps. Uh, like I did last year, I downloaded a game called Alien Isolation, which was uh, 35 gigabytes of data. And when I was your age, that sort of amount of data would have come in a box, which is a bit of a novelty these days for computer games. And it would have come to a box of seven DVDs or maybe 54 CDs if I was going to have 35 gigabytes of data. And it would never have done that anyway because my hard disk wouldn't have been big enough. And that just shows you how quickly technology is changing. But computer games programmers are quite ambitious people. We want to make the most of everything that we have available to us. We want to try and squeeze the very last bits out of every piece of hardware that we're given to make games with. And that's especially true when you look at something like a games console. A games console is, is basically a specialized PC. It's been designed to play games. And the really important thing as far as games programmers are concerned is that a, there's only what, two or three of them. There's only a few different sorts of hardware out there that you have to optimize your game for and make it really work especially well on. Whereas for a PC, you're going to have thousands and thousands of different PCs. And I'm sure you all have tried games that might not work on your machine, or they might not work as well as they do on your friend's machine. And that's just because we can't possibly test our games and make them work perfectly on every single PC. And, uh, and really, the idea is to uh, do things like make the game as fast as possible so that you have a high frame rate. And then you might try and make the game a bit prettier and have more exciting graphical effects. And all of this tries to bring down the frame rate. And it's, about, it's an optimization problem that you have to try and get that to work as well as possible. One important question when you come to write computer games is, who is it that plays computer games? So who here plays computer games? 
I, I struggle to see anybody who doesn't play computer games, I think. So, but originally, it was scientists who were playing computer games. When they had uh, these massive uh, mainframe computers back in the 1960s and early 70s, maybe, uh, it was scientists testing their machines and asking them questions that they wanted to uh, get answered, and they're doing them in a slightly gamey sort of way, perhaps. This didn't really change very much for a little while. It was then university students who were writing games uh, on misappropriated mainframes that they should have been doing science with, but instead they were making games, which I, I think is fair enough, really, if they weren't being used for anything important. Uh, but these days, and since maybe the late 70s, when arcade machines and games consoles became the, sort of everywhere, uh, it's been you guys who've been playing computer games. It's been teenagers and children, mostly. But the people who are writing computer games, we're trying to make money. And because of that, we want everybody to play computer games. And that's really been something that Toa technology has played a big part. The thing that I think has changed that over the past few years has been smartphones. And smartphones have only really been around for 10 years or so. Uh, this isn't a smartphone that you can see on here. This is something that I had when I was at university, uh, which was a bit like a smartphone, but not really uh, having uh, all of the, the exciting app store and uh, uh, all, the, all the bits around it that you have today with your smartphone. When I first got a phone originally, uh, games were pretty rubbish on phones. I had something called Snake, which was not very good. It was about the only game you could possibly get on a phone. And I think the hardware could have been capable of doing a lot better. And, and especially when you look at the Palm Pilot, which is this, this thing here, that was definitely power powerful enough to be able to play a lot of the games that you might play today on a smartphone. But it didn't have those games either. And the reason for that was that it didn't have the App Store. And the thing about that is that people are writing computer games we, we have to make a living. We want to make some money out of it. And therefore, it's not just the technology that's really driving the, uh, the games. It's got to be, can we make money out of the technology and out of the games that we're making for it? So the Palm Pilot, you couldn't buy games. But the smartphones uh, coming out in 2007 and 8, you could buy games. And that was the, the really key ingredient that did it. And money does make the world go round a bit. And adults have got a lot more money than children, which I think is uh, another reason why games have become more universal. So uh, what do you think the most popular computer game is in the world? Does anybody have any ideas on, on that? So what do you think? No? That's right. League of Legends is the most popular computer game in the world. And League of Legends has over 60 million people playing it. Now, that's about the population of the UK. So that's pretty ridiculous, really, to have that many people playing a computer game. And they make a lot of money out of it. How much do you think that the people who are paying for games, paying for League of Legends, pay every year to Riot Games for that? How, how much do you think, in total, that they get paid for that? 10,000 10, 10, pounds. I think you're going to have to go a bit higher than that. What, what do you think? A, mi a million, did you say? Yes. Millions, yeah. Billions. Yeah. That's a bit closer. It's um, over a billion dollars a year. Now, that's, that's enough to buy Manchester United every year. So really, that's a, that's a massive amount of money. But I think another computer game that you probably have, may, may, may not have heard of is perhaps a little bit more impressive. And that's a game called World of Tanks. And World of Tanks is less aimed, perhaps, at children and uh, teenagers than it is at uh, adults. And you drive around in a tank, and you blow people up. And I suppose it's fun, but uh, you know. Uh, and that game uh, it only has, perhaps, uh, 9 million people playing it rather than the 60 million. But it still manages to make half a billion dollars, so a bit less than League of Legends, but with far, far fewer people. And that's because adults have more disposable money to pay for these things. So I think that's just another way of looking at it, to say that, really, technology is all well and good. It's great for us to be able to come up with exciting technology to run computer games and to make com the new generation of computer games. But they do have to be things that help us to make money out of it so that 
games will come to be on those platforms. So I th that's a bit, a, bit, a bit of boring stuff out of the way about money. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about virtual reality, which uh, is something I think is coming soon. Does anybody know what virtual reality is? OK. Uh, not, not very many people know what virtual reality is. OK. Uh, so virtual reality, oh, what, what do you think virtual reality is? Yeah, so, so it's, a virtual, it's a way of having a virtual world and a simulation of reality that isn't reality, but it's going to pretend to be to you. So uh, here, here's a, me wearing a sort of uh, a bit of a headset uh, for virtual reality. And this, the way that this works is it tries to convince you that you're somewhere else, that you're doing something that you're not. Uh, and that's, a, that's quite a difficult challenge. Uh, it's very difficult to be, in fact, to be convincing for a very long time because your brain is quite smart about these things. It, it knows what reality is like. You've been living it for quite a while. Uh, so when you come to show it something that isn't reality, it gets a bit confused. And it can even make you feel a little bit ill when you try and use it. Uh, and and there's a lot of problems that have had to be solved to try and make it convincing for people. For example, if you move your head around, you expect that your visual field will move with it. You don't expect that when you turn, it will then come a bit later. That just makes you feel a little bit seasick, really. Uh, similarly, you, you don't want to ignore what the person wearing the headset is doing. Uh, if they turn their head and their vision still stays looking at the same thing, that's just a bit weird, really. Uh, and even when you do turn your head, and if you've got that right, you don't want it to go all blurry as you turn your head either. Uh, and then there's, there's, there's even more problems with optics and so on. So for example, you have to correct for a lot of distortion that you get based upon the physics of how the lenses work in the headsets. And, and there's a lot more problems as well that are like that that have had to be solved by doing some, some quite hard science so to work out how the brain works and how the eye works and, and taking those, those things that they've learned to make the, the hardware and the software that goes with it. And, and they've made, uh, I think the people who are making these headsets, which I think will probably be out next year, uh, have solved a lot of these problems for people writing computer games so that we can then write the games a lot more easily uh, using that technology. Now, what I said about uh, it have been quite difficult to be convincing for a long time, it is a bit easier to perhaps be convincing for a much shorter period of time. You can uh, be a bit more blasé about perhaps how some of those uh, problems are solved. Uh, and, and for example, you could, uh, Google have made a uh, a thing that they, they can post to you, a, a little cardboard version of a headset which you can put together yourself uh, and wear. Uh, and I know that uh, there's a company that brought something similar with them today uh, that I'm sure you'll be able to try out later. Uh, in fact, here's one that, uh, that's been put together that uh, has uh, made, a, made a foam, which all you do is you take your phone uh, like this, uh, and you load up a little app with uh, this thing on it. and you can just put it into the headset, and then I'm now in a virtual world. Does anybody really want to have a little try of that whilst I? So there you go. So you can move your head around and uh, try it all out. Yeah, just have a little bit of go around. Yeah, so uh, as well as virtual reality, we have uh, a lot of problems with how do we then interact with computer games. And, and you can say that, especially with VR, this has now even created new problems for us to solve along those lines. So how do you interact with your virtual world? Uh, for one thing that uh, we, we might want to solve is when you look down, it seems a bit odd if you look down and you're not there. I mean, today, when you look down right now, you kind of expect to be able to see yourself. If you can't see yourself in the virtual world, that's just that's really quite scary almost. Uh, and even then, when you can see yourself, you want to be able to interact with things. Uh, I know that Microsoft have brought with them today something that uh, uh, lets you use as depth cameras to be able to understand how your hands are interacting with a, a virtual world. If that's not a, a virtual world, perhaps in a, with a headset, but still a virtual world no, nevertheless. And uh, even then, you, there's, there's more problems to solve about how do you get feedback about picking things up? If you try and pick up this item off, that you can see on the desk and your hands don't get stopped by it, that, that's a bit odd, too. That, that jars you out of your virtual experience. Another problem that uh, has been thought about for many, many years is can we just control computers by thinking about it? And, and that's been almost possible for quite a long time. 
uh, it's, you can have devices that you put on your head, uh, and if you think really, really hard, you can make a cursor do something, or you can make your computer do something different. But it, I think that's still quite a long way off in that you need to do a lot of practice to be able to do it. You need to learn to think in a different way to be able to control the computer. And, and that's something that obviously is going to be quite difficult to do for a computer game. There are other problems in virtual reality as well, uh, like uh, if you've got your crazy massive uh, computer game, if you're running around on a, a dam with your, your gun and you're running around trying to take out the bad guys, and yet you're really in your living room, you're going to trip over your sofa, aren't you? You're going to fall over. You're going to run into a wall. I mean, it's going to be pretty hard work to, uh, to do anything with that. I mean, people have done things to try and solve that, like, for example, holding you up with a harness and giving you some furry slippers so that you run around on the spot. But that's just that's quite a heavy bit of uh, equipment to have in your, your living room. Uh, and I think there's still a lot of problems for people to solve along those lines. Another problem is if you're in a virtual world uh, and you're closed into that, you're no longer in the real world, really, are you? You're, you don't know what's going on there. What's, what's happening outside? Uh, you, you've got your headphones on. You've got your, your headset on. Is, is it, it's going to be a bit odd to you know, think, quite scary maybe even, what, to know what's going on next to you. What's the guy sitting next to you doing whilst you're, uh, whilst you're playing this computer game? Anyway. I think that's a little bit enough of that. I think maybe now I've tempted you a little bit about to know about how you might go about getting a job in computer games. So uh, I personally, I, I wanted to be an a engine programmer, somebody who works on the technology underneath uh, computer games. Uh, and that, that's what I, I became. And the, I think if you wanted to do something like that, to work on the core technology of a game, learning to program is obviously going to be something that is important. And something like the micro bit or a Raspberry Pi or something like that is going to be an interesting way to get down to the sort of low-level programming that you might want to be able to do for that. And then you might want to get a, a degree in computer science, which is uh, obviously going to be very important to a company wanting to hire you to be an engine developer. Uh, and you might end up specializing in something like audio or graphics or artificial intelligence for computer games. Uh, and all of these things are very sort of broad options available to you. However, if you are an engine programmer, you might not be quite so involved with how the game works and the strategy of the game and how the, the, how the, the gameplay is in, within the game. And, and there's another job available there, uh, which is a gameplay programmer. And a gameplay programmer works on more on the actual game than they do on the technology, perhaps. But similarly, you would want to know how to program. You'd want to uh, be able to perhaps get a, have a degree in computer science or maybe go to computer games technology or something like that. Uh, but, but they're quite similar roles, really, uh, in that respect. There, there are more creative things, like you could be a, a game designer, uh, somebody who comes up with the ideas behind the game uh, and implements those, perhaps using, uh, using the, the, the skills of the gameplay programmers and uh, engine developers, and, and perhaps some scripting of their own within the game uh, to, to realize their, their dreams. There are obviously much less technical roles perhaps available, like if you've got a community of millions of players, uh, then it's, they, they're going to need to be entertained. They've got, got, got to understand how they interact with each other uh, and, and manage that uh, effectively. One that I, I think is uh, uh, quite a, a good one uh, is I, I'm pretty, I think I'm infallible, but uh, I know I'm not. Uh, and so being able to work out how problems have happened in games and how to reproduce those things so that they can be resolved uh, is, is another important job to be a, perhaps a quality assurance analyst. A new one that's come up though that I think is, is quite exciting is to be a data scientist. Now, that sounds, that sounds a bit odd to be in a computer game and be a data scientist. But a data scientist would take all of the data about the millions of players of your game and how they interact with it and use that data to uh, perform perhaps some, some artificial intelligence on it, uh, techniques on it or some various mathematical techniques to work out 
what you should do next. How should you change your game to make it more fun, to make it more uh, attractive to more players? And, and that's the sort of job that a data scientist would do. And, and a data scientist would perhaps, again, uh, probably want a degree in computer science. And I, I know that, that, for example, the lead data scientist at Jagex has got a PhD in information systems. So you know, it's sort of fairly uh, academic uh, background uh, for that sort of job. And there's many more. And, and not only that, uh, but a lot of smaller games companies will take all of those things and sort of squash them all together into one job uh, of generally working on this game. And that, that is quite a popular thing uh, for people as well. And obviously, a mixture of those backgrounds is something that's going to be helpful to you. Something that you probably haven't really thought about yet at all, given that you, you still have to decide what you want to do for your A-levels and uh, to decide what, what subjects you might want to do at university, is to think what, when you're at university, there's going to be summers and uh, periods perhaps of in, in industry between uh, years where you would want to perhaps work out what sort of job you want to do. And, and one way of doing that is with an internship. And that is where you spend a while working in a, a company, so for example in computer games, and you see if it's right for you, or, and if, if, if the company likes the way that you work as well. And, you, and, and it can be a very good starting point for a career. Uh, I know quite a few people who uh, worked at Jagex who uh, started off as interns uh, at Jagex. Uh, for example, uh, there was uh, one guy I know who uh, started off working as a quality assurance uh, analyst whilst he was uh, uh, doing a computer science degree. And he ended up as the, the lead uh, developer in our innovation team, working on using new technologies to uh, work, make computer games. Uh, and another couple as well I know who uh, started as various programming interns uh, and ended up as senior engine developers uh, working on RuneScape uh, as well. And, and it's not just the case that, that uh, in uh, computer science or that in uh, uh, more technical uh, uh, areas, you might want to do this. Uh, I know that uh, perhaps not all of you might eventually want to, to do that. And uh, another thing, uh, the, another example I have for you is uh, that we had an intern in uh, Player Support looking after uh, the queries from players and uh, all of their questions on how to uh, work with our game. And uh, the, the guy who uh, did that uh, ended up as uh, uh, the commercial director for Jagex. So he ended up being responsible for all the marketing and advertising for the game and, and the strategy for how, uh, how we, we do all of those things. So it's not just the technical sort of thing, the jobs that you might uh, end up doing that for. Anyway, I think I've hopefully covered a few things uh, that about technology and computer games. You might have noticed that I, I may have spent a little bit more time on the past than I have on the future. And I think really that's because it's quite difficult to predict the future. If I was to look back 10 years ago, I would probably wouldn't have guessed that smartphones were going to be the massive computer games platform that they uh, ended up being, quite probably because I had a Palm Pilot, which wasn't. And I, I think that really the thing to remember is that, that you guys are going to be the ones who, in 10 years, maybe are going to be making the, the choices, that make me the understanding of, of what is going to be the future of computer games, perhaps, or of other industries as well. And I think that the best way for us to predict the future is to invent it, uh, as uh, is a great quote for you. Uh, and I think that's something that you probably want to remember. Uh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.